Well, ahoy there, dad and lovely listeners, and welcome to the brand newest installment of the greatest horror movie review podcast in this world and the next, and the next, and the next. Why? It's dead and lovely, here with the host of the most... Who is that handsome man I got on the on the other end of this uh, Skype call here? What's going on? Who is that? <laughs> it's me, old Foghorn Hollywood Steve. <laughs> oh, Foghorn Hollywood Steve. Yeah, well, huh? you said ahoy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Keep it on, on brand. Keep it nautical. And then the lighthouse, and then I was like, man, remember how loud that <laughs> Foghorn was? <laughs> I'm going to try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's me, your good buddy, Uncle Ben. And Steve, I'm here to tell you, I had one of the goddamn stupidest dreams I have ever had the other night. Let me hear it. <laughs> so, you know, we're no strangers on this podcast to, of course, talking about DMX. We talk about right, DMX obviously. quite a lot. Yeah. And um, in this dream that I had, I was thinking about how in DMX songs... You know, there's like the main parts where he's rapping the verses and stuff, but right. then there's also kind of the little overdubs that are like the hype tracks, where it's uh-huh. like him being like, yeah. where my dog's at? Get him! Stuff like that, right? Uh-huh. And I was just sort of imagining DMX recording the hype track in the studio, Yeah. but like what some of the outtakes and stuff would be like, and him like messing up his own little hype track that he put over it, <laughs> and just being like, oh, where did my dogs go? I cannot find my dogs. <laughs> Get them. The, the dogs are here. Where's the dog? Meow. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and that was my dream. DMX is going to hear this and get mad. <laughs> yeah, he's going to quit listening to the show, yeah. drop the Patreon support, everything. I am not a cat. <laughs> but I was just thinking about just how fucking silly that would be. Yeah, it would be. Because you know there's some bloopers and outtakes on those things. Yes, there are. There have to be, right? <laughs> Steve, you sound a year older than last time I talked I to you. What's going yeah. on here? Yeah, I'm a year older, a year wiser, man. You're hotter. You're mm. hotter, that's true. That is true. Mm-mm-mm. Wow. I age like a fine-ass wine. That's right, man. Fine-ass wine, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and a wine that... Straight from your ass. <laughs> Did you have yourself a good old Gebert's tog? Yeah, I had me I had me one of them at birthdays, and boy, I'll tell you what, it was we didn't do much <laughs> because hell yeah, you know, pandemic and all. Twenty twenty, we stayed home and didn't do much, but we we had a good time. But this was fun, Ben. <laughs> the day before my birthday. I was trying out a new chest workout. Yeah. Basically, uh, the exercise was uh, you you put your arms out a little bit wider than normal for a push up, and then you do the push up on either side. So you're putting you're putting your weight on one arm and then the other arm. And I did it and had, did the rest of my workout and didn't feel any pain or whatever. And then later, like the next day was my birthday. And my back was starting to feel a little sore. And then the next day it was it was real tight. And then the next day, like I could feel like just reaching around. I could feel a bunch of knots in my back. Ooh, you're naughty. Yeah. And then like my shoulder and neck started hurting and my my tricep. And mm. well, what of your neck, your back? Oh, my pussy and my crack? Uh, my pussy was fine. My crack was all <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> you don't want that happening. Yeah. Uh, but so all, I was getting all this pain and these knots and shit. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? Uh, and then I was just feeling around trying to feel if there were other knots. And I, I felt my my mid chest, my pectoralis minor. And that motherfucker was tight as hell. But it didn't Uh-oh. hurt. Hmm. And guess what, Ben? When your pectoralis what? minor gets tight, it pulls your shoulder forward, which takes most any of the pain away from it, so you don't notice it, but it causes all that other stuff to start happening. Hmm. And that sounds really not fun. Guess how much not fun it can be. I didn't, Luckily, this was on my right side. This happens on people's left side, and guess what they think they're having? 
Oh, probably the old heart attacky, huh? Yeah, tightness in the chest, pain on the left side of your your body. Like people Palm think sweaty. they're having a heart attack. Mom spaghetti sweater already. I mean, just a whole nine yards. Yeah. So <laughs> if you're ever starting to feel like tons of pain in your back and your shoulder and your neck, one do worry about a heart attack for sure. Like you know, get yourself checked out. But uh, just check and see. If your muscles, it's like right in the middle of your chest. It's a triangular muscle. Just check and see if that's real tight. Uh, Cause that might be causing a ton of problems. I, I just started like massaging it and doing some stretches and all that pain went away. And I was like really worried I had fucked something up, but it was just like a tiny little issue. But tiny little issues in the human body can cause major problems. And see, that's why we're the fucking horror kings, man. It's like, I know all kinds of people that are walking around going, man, I really love listening to these horror movie right? review podcasts, <laughs> but none of them feature guys that are getting on into their late 30s talking about their health problems. Yeah. I wish there was one out there. There is. And then it's they right find here. our show, uh-huh. and they never fucking turn back. They drop all the other ones because they yep. know they're riding with the kings. And if you don't like it, you can unfriend me on Facebook, Snowflake. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> How's your like fitness journey been going, man? I know that like yeah. when the gyms were open and stuff, of course you're yeah, making a lot of headway. Day. Yeah, I'm still doing a lot of working out at home. Uh, just not getting as much, uh, 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 what do you call that? Cardio as okay, I was getting yeah. at the gym. So I haven't really lost weight. I've just been in the same region for a while. But for my birthday, I bought me some hiking shoes. And Ooh. Hey, take a hike, Steve. <laughs> I'm going to. Within, <laughs> within uh, uh, 15 miles of my house, there are two state parks. So oh. I'm going to start hiking nearby and try to get a little bit more cardio and maybe get down, slim down a little bit more finally get those goddamn awesome superhero abs awesome that's a good move right there it's yep. a pro move especially with fall approaching and stuff that sounds like that's a pretty wise activity to engage well, in i gotta hold like off a good until time. next summer for sure like i don't want who wants to have pandemic abs that's a good point yeah that's just a waste yeah who's gonna see him <laughs> fucking nobody nobody yeah right on man i've also been uh, accelerating my fitness journey on our, our cheap ass kind of bullshit elliptical machine that we got off yeah. Amazon that's already having little parts break off of it even though we've had it for like two or three weeks but it's okay because yeah. it still works and I'm still using it all the time so that's cool <laughs> right it's uh, fine how much did it cost was it expensive it's like $200 man buy yeah. nice or buy twice yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that is but true. you know what it's the best piece of exercise equipment in the whole house so I can't <laughs> knock it that's and I'll tell you point. what man this week, I have been on kind of a quest oh, for yeah? some new tunes and stuff. Because oh, yeah. I, th- I think what kind of got me thinking about it here is like, usually by this time of year, I've played like a billion gigs right. with a bunch of different artists. So and I'm always having a whole like, bunch of stuff and gotten yeah, new recommendations. Yeah, like learn new yeah. music and all this kind of thing. And I was like, man, this year I really haven't had to do any of that. Yeah. You know? So I think that's what got me hungering for some new music. And. Just kind of on a whim, actually. There was a night last week where my wife, she was on the TikTok, like you do, taking and talking, and people put little little musical things on their on their ticking talks that they put up. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of them had this particularly dope jam that I really enjoyed. And I said, "Wait!" I said, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Is that a Thundercat?" And my wife said, "Yeah, that is the Thundercat. Them changes." And I was like, "You know what?" I've always heard about this guy because especially as like a bass player, people are always telling you to check out Thundercat and stuff. I'd never really listened to him before. Uh, but this Tick and Talk just piqued my interest. So I started listening this week to Thundercat's album, Drunk, and it is fucking awesome. Okay. Oh my God. It is like the audio equivalent of wrapping up in a warm blanket. Oh. It's just okay. really cool. You know, it's, it's funky. It's a little bit r and b Definitely some hip hop influence and stuff in there too, but some very weird, weird things going on musically. I think the guy is fucking awesome. His tiny desk NPR thing that came out a couple of years ago is really cool. I realize I'm like a million years late to this party. Drunk came out in like 2017. I'm way late to it. But I was recommending that you check some of it out too. And yeah. I got to thinking about it and doing some research. Turns out you've already listened to a lot of his playing because he apparently played all over 
to Pimp a Butterfly by oh, Kendrick Lamar. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and so I, you've already heard a bunch of his okay, stuff. Okay, I did start listening to that album and was enjoying it, and uh, stopped listening because something happened and didn't get back to it. But this is a reminder; I should get back there to that. There you album. go. Yeah, I think that you should. Yeah. Really, really awesome stuff, man. So that's been a little highlight. Another highlight of my week has definitely been seeing how many of our dead and lovelies, and how many of my my watchers on my my guitar YouTube channel have contributed to our good buddy Brandon's GoFundMe uh, oh, page yeah. and his fight against cancer. We had Brandon on the show a couple weeks ago doing the changeling, mm-hmm. and we talked about his GoFundMe page and his ever-increasing medical bills and stuff. And uh, we posted up links to his things, and then recently in one of my guitar videos, I offered up a special bonus video to anybody who donates to Brandon's fund. And, man, uh, th- the growth has just been absolutely incredible. Like, it seriously has warmed my heart so much to see people donating to a friend of ours just based on the recommendation of us saying this is a cool guy that needs help you know i mean most of these people are never gonna fucking meet the guy or anything they're just taking our word for it It, it's the kind of thing man where you know especially this year we've seen the worst of humanity day in and day out over and over and over and my general opinion of humanity was getting low and then stuff like that happens where you get people reaching out and helping people out that they don't even know. And it, it seriously was just like, you know, faith in humanity stat got raised up plus 30. Yeah. Really fucking awesome to see yeah. people chipping Some in. Some real so, good news yeah. for the week. Yeah, yeah. no doubt, was nice, No doubt. Nice to see. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. glad that everybody uh, 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 got on Brandon's side because he's a great guy. As you can tell from the podcast, he knows horror well knows film well and he's a great dude so if uh, if you haven't gone over and and uh donated to him um i'll post the link again yeah there you go and i'll tell you what steve we also had ourselves a pretty laid back chill birthday week in our home as well because oh, yeah. the day the day before your birthday uh-huh. your wife a is birthday. my wife was a birthday and we kind of celebrated by Pretty much doing what you guys did. Yeah. Chilling out, doing nothing, not having a plan, eating and drinking all day. Yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah. Now, dude, my birthday this year was awesome. It's exactly what I wanted to do, man. I, I didn't do anything. Yeah, it's <laughs> didn't, great. Didn't do a fucking thing, and it was awesome. Uh, so, yeah, we had a great time, man. We had time to watch a couple of flicks in between all of our boozing and schmoozing and gifting and carrying on. Uh On the weekend there, whenever we were just chilling out and enjoying a a fine charcuterie plate from Mm -hmm. Hen Hawk Butcher Shop in Old City, Knoxville. Shout out, not a sponsor, just think they're really fucking cool. Do they make a heart shape of like salami? A heart shape of heart. It was actually it was actually just a beef heart. It was was just a beef heart. And you're Mm -hmm, like, huh? Get it? And she was like halfway through the heart. With blood dripping down her face, like, what? Get what? Yeah, huh? Oh, I didn't get a look at it, really. <laughs> it's like that scene from Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> we watched ourselves a couple of things. We watched a Raising Arizona. Always a crowd pleaser. Yeah, I love Raising Arizona. I'm uh, never disappointed to see that on television. Yeah, that's a yeah. ridiculous movie. We, uh, we watched... Les Miserables as we did a puzzle. That was yeah. a special birthday treat. I uh, Did you sing everything you said as you did it? <laughs> I did, and I just wept. <laughs> yeah. Uh, true story. I, I don't really like puzzles. That's never really been a okay. thing that I enjoyed, but my mm. wife, she really likes a puzzle. My so wife as part as well. of her birthday, it was like, hey, I buy it a puzzle. We do it a puzzle together. So we put on Les Miserables as we did a puzzle, and uh, we did it. We did the thing. That's All 500 really cool. pieces. Wow. So you, yeah. you no help pushed from through. You were like, I'm going to do this. And yeah. which one of you hit a piece? Actually, none. Yeah. We made it through without doing that. Yeah. What? You did it completely adult style? That's crazy. Mm-hmm. We did. Yeah. yeah. Madness, I remember man. as Madness. kids, because uh, like my, my aunt would always do these like 500,000 piece puzzles, really got into difficult puzzles and stuff. But as kids... She hated us because we would take a piece so that we would be the last one to put a piece in, but we'd all do it. <laughs> so you just so the whole she thing would be getting near the end and there'd be like four pieces gone and me and my cousins and my sister would be like, I don't know, because we wanted to be the last one to put it in. Oh, uh, man. Had to be frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> 
all of you guys just holding yeah. back. My wife Damn, man. Uh, is huge, huge on doing puzzles. She has a puzzle app on her phone, and she ha- she's so proficient at the puzzles that she actually does them in patterns. What? It's really interesting. She will do like... It, like she'll an do, X shape or something. Yeah, she'll do it because at the end of the app, it like shows how you put it together in like a like a little gift a type of thing. Yeah, montage type of thing. So she d- she'll do it in pattern, so it looks cool whenever you see what? that at the end. Yeah, she loves puzzles. Good God. Yeah, puzzle people are interesting people. <laughs> dude this week you know also we we do our, our docu monday thing where we watch oh, a documentary yeah. on mondays and mm-hmm. stuff my choice this week so we watched the decline of western civilization oh, part two the yeah. metal years okay okay how'd that go for holy you? shit man so i had always seen clips of it of course like the famous like chris holmes drowning in a pool of vodka uh-huh. scenes and stuff like that i had never watched the whole thing before Holy shit, man. It is just... It's Full just the people. worst <laughs> and the best and the worst. And then it's the best. And then it's actually the worst. Yeah. yeah full of nothing but society's finest human beings. <laughs> oh, my God. Everybody in it yeah. is a piece of garbage. I <laughs> like bet. Like, all of them, dude. And the thing about it is, is everybody is so sure that they're cool <laughs> and that they're really doing the right thing and wearing cool clothes and they're doing their hair in a way that looks really neat. Like we should always keep the decline of Western civilization part two around just to show to people to be like, as a reminder, these people thought they were cool too. So the next time some other stupid bullshit fashion trend or music aesthetic or whatever comes out, you just need to hold up that documentary and be like, these guys thought they were cool too, just That's, so you know. What period does that cover? Is it the 80s? Yeah, yeah, it's all kind of through the glam and hair metal period, but they've also got like like Megadeth and stuff in there. You're telling me an entire generation of people uh, grew up insisting that something that was very obviously not cool was cool are now in their 50s and 60s still insisting that someone who's very obviously not cool is cool? Trump? I mean, as wild as that sounds, yeah. yes. Huh. Yes, that is exactly it's weird. what I'm saying. It's weird. Like, they haven't changed at all. Wow. That is strange, <laughs> huh? <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting because I guess while you were watching that, Emily and I were watching a movie called We Summon the Darkness, which is set in 1988 and is about the metal scene. Oh, yeah? Is it good? Yeah. It, uh, it's a horror movie. It's I, um, It's not great. But it is good. It's got Alexandra Daddario, who I love. Also, Johnny Knoxville in like a very small role. But okay, uh, that sounds cool. Yeah, it's it's got it's worth a watch. I would say I'm not gonna claim it's it's like great or groundbreaking, but it was worth a watch for sure. Okay, sounds pretty good. You watch anything else good this week? Uh, uh, Emily and I started season six of BoJack Horseman. Um, it's sad and awesome i mean it's bojack that's what bojack is sad and awesome okay still i've never watched any of it i'm way behind the curve man you should watch it it is a really 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 great show definitely uh good for anybody who um uh, anybody who worked in entertainment i think really okay i've done that i've done a little bit of that it is very much uh, focused on the you know how we all feel like pieces of shit sometimes or like we're not funny or good or whatever and how some people who are super successful feel like that all the time i mean that sounds exactly like something i need to watch just to put on relax and have a laugh at the yeah. end of a day of making content i you know surprisingly i think for people who uh deal with it it actually is really cathartic because of the way they deal with it and the the Word. like the the insight they have into this the feelings that you're having like the, okay it, it it really like it surprises me that it connects with so many people but i think it's probably because it's also connecting on the level of just um people with uh depression anxiety all these different things but 
I think it, it's also so super specific to entertainment and people who are trying to make a living out of making a huckster's living i guess basically like the mm -hmm. the real base of the entertainment industry is like a hustle and a, a a whole lot of smoke and mirrors and you can really feel empty about it because it can be empty word man dang okay so the yeah. sixth season is it like the last one yeah so it's i think it's probably like 70 something episodes total and mm -hmm. they're about 20 something minutes each so it's not it's not a long watch and really once you start watching it it, it grips you you do want to just keep watching it. damn dude sounds intense sounds intense man uh, it's mostly honestly like as intense as it sounds and as intense as it gets it's a world where like human people and animal people exist and a talking horse had a show that was basically full house like it's also absurd and silly like there's tons and tons of ridiculous humor throughout and there's a dog man who gets distracted by tennis balls and shit so like oh it's it's as intense as it gets it's also as silly okay all right all right so it swings both ways on that it does on that pendulum huh? it swings both ways you catch anything else good this week uh, uh yeah i've been watching a lot of wrestling <laughs> oh yeah a little yeah. razzle dazzle Don't huh talk too much about it again <laughs> i think the only other thing worth noting that we watched this week we're still on the marvel train and we watched uh black panther oh right the yeah. other night mm -hmm. i heard a rumor that that michael b jordan guy did upwards of and this is hard to believe 30 sit-ups a day to get prepared for that role. I bet he might have did a few more than that, even. <laughs> no, I heard it was 30, 30 minimum. Just the 30. I don't know if it ever got to 40. Yeah. I mean, that's like physically impossible, so I don't think he yeah. did that. Is there, I mean, it's a, around the time of Creed, uh, so he would he was in great shape. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely so. That's a cool movie, man. I think I think that one still holds up, and yeah, they put so it. much work into the... The costumes and the set oh, design man. and stuff. Yeah. Fucking awesome. So man. much yeah, work and thought into representing this I I mean, like, if you can't see Wakanda for what it is, which is this uh, utopia, like this like what would it be like if we could exclude the uh evil businessmen that are trying to exploit Africa's resources from all of this? If yeah, we could totally, just yeah. build this kingdom of Wakanda, this beautiful world where everything is just, I mean, there's some politics, but it's, it's pretty much a utopia. Yeah, it's just a vision of what an uncolonized Africa yeah. could have could been. Could have been, yeah. Yeah, really, really cool flick, man. I, I do think it is a little bit CGI heavy oh, at yeah, the end, like that heavy. last... Yeah, fight scene yeah. just mm. it really feels like a video game and it's like yeah. man i wish they would have given us something more visceral because like yeah. the waterfall fight sequences and stuff awesome. are really good yeah. they're very solid and then the end of the movie just because it's so cgi heavy it just feels soft like you don't feel blows connecting you know what i mean yeah yeah no i agree with that but uh and i, and I wish they hadn't killed killmonger yeah i know he right? was really good i wish they had oh, yeah. had him in prison or something but of course i love i mean it's exactly his reasoning that that convinces me yeah they had to kill him imprisoning him would have been the the worst torture for that character right yeah still holds up really really good flick man i think the next one that we got is i think ragnarok is next yeah which is so fucking good man uh -huh. so good well, you awesome. know what, Steve? We're not here to talk about wrestling and DMX oh, and uh, um, um, working out right. and all that stuff. We're a horror movie show. We've got to talk about oh, a horror movie, Steve. Right, right, right. Yeah, let's do that. Do you think there's one that you'd like to talk about this week and do mm, a little review ski on? You know, I got a friend, got a pal, got a guy who's a patron uh -huh, of this podcast mm -hmm. named Tim Stone. Oh, you're talking about the Tim Stone? The Tim Stone. <gasps> Yeah, yeah, oh my yeah. God. Mm -hmm. The same Tim Stone that supports us at the $5 level on Patreon, thus enabling him to put in a wild card movie choice into the smoking bowl yeah. of, of future podcast movie review episode choices that's that we draw it. from. That's the one, yeah. And it's I, concisely I, named. He. <laughs> it's weird that we <laughs> named it that, but it is concise. Uh, and he put Tells what it is. the faculty into that bowl and... 
I just happened to draw it right out. So let's talk about the faculty. You know what, Steve? It's a movie that's just full of of bright young minds. Uh They're re-entering the school system. It really kind of reminds me of this time of year, Steve. We got, you know, the summer's starting to close out. It's still hot, but there's the promise of a cool fall headed our way. Yeah. We got the kids heading back into school. It's sort back of, to school them, time. Yeah. 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 None of them really should be. <laughs> no, but, no, they should not um, be, but they but are. They, but they are. Yeah. yeah. And for a long time, kids had to engage in a little back to school tradition. And Steve, this is one of those things that I always heard about. Yeah. But me being a homeschool never really got to find out about steve i don't know about going yeah. back to school i live at the school how can you go back if you never left <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> <laughs> so steve i say before we start reviewing the faculty i'm gonna need you to take me on a little trip to the preview palace here Ba-ding-ding. all right everyone take a seat okay this is me i'm your teacher mr spratling I'm gonna rambunctious. uh, Now listen here, you children. This is the preview palace. Welcome to it. (laughs) And Steve, as we're here in the preview palace, I just want you to maybe broaden my worldview and fill in the gaps of my own history that don't really know about going back to school, Steve. See, I got ready to go back to school. I've got my backpack. Um, I'm using both straps to get good proper back support. That way I'm not putting all the weight on one side. Now, you're already, you're so far ahead. Do you think kids just come with backpacks? Yeah, I thought. They don't? That's, no, that's part of back (gasps) to school. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god yeah, man i know See, this is how little i know man. i know they didn't just come with backpacks these children you gotta go a uh, shopping for things wow i always heard about this and i would use this as an opportunity as a young homeschooled man to head to the local walmart or whatever was close around and stock up on some pencils and markers and stuff like that for my art supplies yeah mm. so you were like oh this is fun times to go and pick up some fun stuff well let me give you the experience that very few people will also agree with i imagine i loved that too i yeah? loved going and getting back to school supplies I don't Hell know why. Yeah. I love notebooks. I love pens. I love pencils. I'm a huge fan of them. And I I'm always. I'm a stationary guy. Yeah. I always wanted to go be involved in this. Now, I, I think a lot of people maybe will agree with the excitement of that, but most people probably weren't excited to get back to school. I was. So the back to school shopping was big for the school supplies, but you also had to go, Ben, and get some new clothes. Oh, you got to get the fashions. Yeah, you can't be showing up with this shirt you wore last year, mostly because you've grown and it's a belly shirt now. Oh, man. You got to get some fresh new fly clothes, right? So if I'm if I'm going back to school, I need to be looking for one of those cool like um, uh, MR Ducks shirts or something Mm, like that, right? Maybe maybe like a, a. Big Johnson's T-shirt or like a no a no fear shirt, something like yeah, that. Yeah, if you're an edgy eighth grader, you get a Big Johnson shirt. Sure, maybe <laughs> maybe you know, like the teacher doesn't get it, so nobody calls you out on it. But, okay, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, maybe you get a uh, a shirt. My mom bought me this shirt, and I, and I wish I still had it. It had a, a a cool cat leaned back on a tree with some sunglasses on. Oh hell and a yeah! A little word bubble that said, "I'm sick of school." Oh man, that's yeah. pretty badass. That's making a statement wearing that yeah. to school, especially for a kid who loves school. <laughs> 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 but yeah, man, I remember so many times, like, uh, yeah, the back to school shopping. Just like I remember, like, uh, buying a backpack. For because like in elementary school you don't like exactly need a backpack i think they do now but back when we were kids uh you weren't taking books home like yeah i mean we also didn't need to smoke when we were that young but of course we we did did. i mean it eased the tension when we were down in the mines working or on the two mile uphill both ways walk to school Mm -hmm, that's right yeah yeah, but yeah, we didn't have to. You're right. Uh, 
But yeah, like, uh, what was I saying? Fuck. <laughs> Getting the back and pack. Oh, backpacks. Yeah, I remember backpacks. Uh, backpacks and trapper keepers were my, like, the thing I wanted the most. I had this dope trapper keeper now did you ever have a trapper keeper ben okay i was gonna get to this so trapper keepers were one of those things that i think honestly made me want to go to public school right just to have one yeah (laughs) because i actually sort of inherited one from my older brother because my older brother did go to school a couple of years more than me like three years more than me because he is three years older than me right and uh so he had a trapper keeper or two from his school days that i re-inherited and you know put like plain white paper and used as art notebooks Uh for my drawings okay and dude i i just had a dream long ago of of growing up to become the world's most prestigious and famous trapper keeper artist because (laughs) there's nothing fucking cooler than the art they would put on a trapper keeper back in the day i wanted to be a part of that scene yeah i i could absolutely see that being an art installment now because you know that that is i mean you know uh charles clary great artist he does the 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 paper carvings in the the vhs boxes uh gallery 1984 in la just has tons and tons of like this art that's dedicated to pop culture of the 80s and 90s like yeah I, i could see that trapper keeper art being an installment somewhere that'd be really cool mine was an understated uh, red and black design that was kind of sleek on the outside. On the inside, I had the rad folders. Oh, shit. Freak in the sheets. Yeah, that's how I do. <laughs> From back in third grade. Uh- <laughs> Art ass, dude. Dude, and I'm sure the back to school traditions and stuff have not changed one iota. Oh, I'm sure that kids these days are still getting the trapper bit. keepers and stuff. But there is one thing that I know hasn't changed about back to school shopping specifically, and that is having to buy stuff for the school you're going to because the government refuses to fund them. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, having to buy like Kleenexes and and construction paper and shit, you know, so the teacher didn't have to pay out of their meager salary. Wow, that's really that hasn't awesome, changed. man. So, good thing we still got that going, that tradition. Yeah, underfunded schools, badass. Yeah, I, now let's get into some of the things that I think are maybe gonna clash with your homeschool upbringing. I really want to use this as a way of also finding out more about Ben. Okay. I so like one of the things that most of us are used to about school is having to get shots. Oh, like like tequila shots, whiskey shots. Uh, yeah, kinda. Except they like inoculate you from things. Hmm, I take whiskey shots every night to inoculate myself from my feelings. Oh. <laughs> Did you have that same experience, like, around the time when no. the semester would be starting up? You'd be like, uh-uh. well, you gotta go get these shots. No, no. My first, like, semester at community college at Walter State where we met, it was like, well, before you go to school here, you have to have shots and stuff. And I was like, for what? <laughs> Why? Is this a college thing? Like, I seriously didn't it's understand. human existence thing. <laughs> <laughs> It's called modern society, sir. Yeah. yeah, no, I totally did not have to do that. That was the first time that I'd had shots since I was probably fucking six years old or something. Wow. Yeah. You had to do this every year, though? Mm, um, Not every year. I mean, some of them, you had to get a few boosters, so it would be, yeah, like, for a few years there, it kind of just sticks in my mind as like, oh, I got to go back to school. I got to get this booster. Got to get this shot. Then, of course, there's there's... Another aspect of shopping, Ben, that I know you didn't have to deal with, and this right. is having to buy stuff from your school. Say, from for instance, the school. yeah, for gym class, uh, having Ugh. to buy your your gym uniform and getting to find out what you get to wear for an hour a day, five days a week. But guess what? That sounds like a blast. You're all wearing it. So, ooh, very nice. It kind of works, but then there's always the rich kids who get better stuff and wear it. And then we find out that the majority of the school districts is poor and some of them are assholes. Wow, that sounds like <laughs> so much fun, Steve. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the good times, huh? But this is also the back to school when you're coming back, the best. The This is just. 
I mean, it's it's not a tradition. It's just a natural occurrence. Getting back to school is seeing a ton of people you haven't seen in a while. Okay, um, that sounds all right. That first day of school, it can be terrible, especially if you hate everybody at school. That makes sense. Maybe you're a maybe you're a Stokely type. Oh yeah, a uh-huh. little attitude problem, huh? Yeah, and you're like, oh, you're such a spies or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe that's it. But mostly, it's like, oh my gosh, my friends. Uh, it's a, an experience that you don't get to have a lot as an adult. Because, like, uh, those sort of ancillary coincidental friendships don't happen as much. Like, you got people at work, but most of us try to keep some sort of distance between work and regular life. Uh, But at school, it was just like, oh, my gosh, I've got so many friends. And getting back to them was just this real cool moment of getting to see people who, you know, you find out as an adult... Uh, you don't retain that friendship. But if you even thought about it for a second as a kid, it was like, oh, we didn't see each other for three months and I didn't think about it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. (laughs) But it is cool (laughs) to see you now. (laughs) See, that's the thing is like, I couldn't have had a more different experience than that because for me, whenever I went back to school, it was like, oh boy, back to school time. There's my mom and my brother again. (laughs) Guess they're still at this school. Okay. Who's the principal this year? It's dad. Got it. Yep, still dad. Principal dad. Principal dad. (laughs) That sounds like a movie. I want to play that part in a movie. I need to write that movie, and I am in the movie as principal dad. Yep. That sounds great. (laughs) I mean, this all sounds very exciting. It sounds like I missed out on quite a lot. Well, not really. No, I mean, honestly, <laughs> it was really fun, but um, looking back on it, it's it's just, it's fun because we all experience, it's fun because it's a shared, um, I guess a shared trauma, a shared, like we all went <laughs> through the same shit together. Yeah. So it is nice to have that, I guess, but it also would be better if our school systems were better. You know what? That would be nice, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Well, damn, man, I feel like my worldview has greatly been extended by this installment of the Preview Palace. Thank you for sharing the traditions, the gifts, the pageantry of all things back to school. I feel like I'm ready to get in that institution and get learnt. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Billy Madison was a movie. I can't just go back? No, 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 no. Have you? Did oh. you sign up already? I mean, yeah. Did they accept you? I mean, no, but I was just going to show oh, up. Okay. Oh, okay. If they had accepted you, I was going to say, well, I guess it's okay. But <laughs> since they didn't, yeah, you're going to have to do like a like a Drew Barrymore undercover. I'm a, t- I'm a child, I guess you would say. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> fellow young people, I will I'm say. I'm Jack. Just tell them you're Jack. They'll get it. Yeah, I'll, I'll show up and just be like, hey playstation am i right (laughs) i just realized that if let's just say you were to go back to kindergarten right now and one of your teachers had recently graduated if you said to them i am jack they might not get what you're talking about that's fair wow (laughs) we're old we're old you know what steve i think just due to my my lack of going back to school and my realization of my impending demise and my old age i just feel like i need something to drown my sorrows in oh maybe a a liquid beer oh oh yeah let's do that too yeah (laughs) a can of liquid beer steve what do we got on today we got an el segundo brewing (gasps) it's broken skull ranch ipa this is brewed with stone cold steve austin cold stone cream austin that's right yeah steve austin's broken skull ipa this was given to us by lamar who uh, yeah i talked about last year he came through last summer and dropped off some beers for us hung out for a little bit well we did the same this time we sat uh outside on opposite sides of the table on opposite ends of the table at merchants of beer we had a few beers but yeah he brought us uh, he brought us some great stuff and uh, we've got uh, yeah, a few that i'll have some stories about but this is just oh boy 
Steve Austin's Broken Skull IPA because I had been saying I wanted to try it. And I am so excited. excited because I've also been dying to try this. Obviously, we love ourselves a Cold yeah. Stone Cream Austin. And yeah. the fact that the fact that he made a beer, extra cool points. The fact that he made an IPA, extreme Surprising. cool points, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. You would think it would be a lager or something like that. No, Stone Cold is not a basic man. No, huh? This is probably not the kind of beer that you could, you know... Uh, grab two of, smash on your forehead, and spray all over your face. You probably want to <laughs> sip this one instead. You probably do want to sip on this one instead. Yeah. <laughs> what, instead if have, of... <laughs> what if though that was the whole gimmick? Is like they make these and they don't even put a perforation or a tab to open it on yeah, top. You have to just slam it on your head. To dr- yeah, the whole it. can is just sealed. Yeah. That well, that's why it's called Broken Skull IPA. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. Yeah. You gotta crush this fucking thing if you want to drink it. <laughs> yeah, so it says here, let's see, uh, a badass 6.7% IPA by Steve Austin and Elsa Gundo Brewing, blah, blah, blah. It features Citra, Cascade, and Chinook hops. Okay, I like Some all of those. my favorite things yeah. right there. It's a nice clear color, a nice amount of effervescence to it. Just yeah. a nice golden glass of goodness here. I'm excited to get into this thing right yeah. here. Yeah, let me get me a sip on this. See what that thing does for you there. See if it gives you a just a damn old stone cold stunner. Do you hear the glass breaking Ooh. as soon as you get that first sip? Uh man, that is that is it, it's hoppy, but it's got like a real clean Ooh. finish. It's not like overly hoppy. Uh That's like it doesn't good. stick with you. It's just like a good clean hop drink. Clean is exactly the word I would use to describe it. It's got a mm-hmm. very light citrusy mm-hmm. sort of flavor in there, but it's not at all overpowering. Still tastes like it, a beer flavored beer to me. It does. It actually almost tastes like a, a hoppy lager. Like mm-hmm. it's so easy, like drinking. But yeah, good, good hop to it. Smooth. Also, go, Stone Cold. Especially considering that this isn't like a overwhelmingly mega hopped beer that tastes yeah. like fucking blueberry cobbler or some shit. Right. Uh-huh. It's incredible that this is 6.7 and is that smooth. Oh, yeah. Like, it seems wow. like that's not the kind of flavor that would be easy to hide alcohol behind. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll tell El Segundo for sure. You need to work on that distribution. I do not know why this is not available all over the southeast. People love Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh huh. And we love drinking a cold yeah. beer. I'll tell you. I that, mean, they'll man. be a little bit scared of the IPA label, but I think they'll get into this. This is a drinkable IPA. This doesn't taste like a pine cone for sure. Oh yeah, no, not at all. It's not overwhelmingly just fucking palate destroying. I feel like you could have this one with a fine meal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can just be eating a burger or a steak or something with this. Something Great. manly. So, yeah. Better not eat anything <laughs> like fish. Yeah, uh, yeah don't I probably, eat. I probably uh, wouldn't eat tofu. fish with this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really, really good, man. Thanks yeah. so much, Lamar, awesome. Thanks, for Lamar. dropping those. It looks like in the box of beers that you dropped off here, there was a lot of other goodies in there. Oh, that yeah. I'm really no, excited to get yeah, into. Yeah, we got a whole lot of stuff to look forward to, including a Warhead Sour. Which, oh my god, I'm so excited about yeah. that, dude. <laughs> That's gonna be awesome. I'll tell you what, this is this is my like basic bitch complaint about like quarantine and stuff like that. It's like obviously, yeah, it's like I, I miss going to the gym and the movie theater yeah. and shit like that. But you know the thing that like I really miss the most, I think, that just kinda like hit me recently. Well, probably not more than the gym, but something that I really miss <laughs> in general is dude like going to a bar yeah. and ordering a beer and getting it in a glass a glass oh, yeah. of yeah. straight out of the tap beer like i'll go to the outdoor patios and stuff like merchants of beer yeah you know, in, in, in knoxville and stuff and set out on the patio and they bring you a plastic cup and plastic i cup, understand yeah. which makes sense Although, yeah you know what it doesn't it, it doesn't it doesn't because i mean those sanitizers you run glasses through get like yeah. a billion fucking degrees so that's true yeah and if if somebody coughs on a plastic cup nobody's gonna wash it like if it just gets incidental breathe on it yeah yeah but i I miss having a glass i feel like fucking jack nicholson in the shining a glass of beer (laughs) a glass of beer (laughs) yeah i miss that man yeah all right steve we're here today to talk about La Faculty. La Faculty. Oh, oh, welcome to 1998. Oh, Beau Baton. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> this is made by, of course, the Frenchman Robert Rodriguez. <laughs> we call him Bob Rod. Oh, Bob Rod. Rod. Yeah. <laughs> and dude, this is the first time that I have ever seen this movie. We've talked about oh, yeah. it mm-hmm. a bunch of times on the podcast. It's just yes, kind of come have. up in conversation. And uh, it's one of those that I wanted to hold off on watching because I knew eventually we'd do it on the show. Yeah. And then our boy Tim Stone just goes out and fucking hits a home run and lands it right in our laps. Yeah, hell yeah. But I'm, I assume I'm this excited. is not the first time you saw it, right? No, it is not. I Yeah, I saw it back in the day. This is just one of those that was, you know, amongst the crop of Scream and um, uh, Urban Legend and things like that. So, I, it, obviously, I was going to watch it, but yeah. this was different. I remember this stuck out, whereas, mm-hmm. like, I... You know, we've done Urban Legend. I hate that movie. I think it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> Scream, I love those movies. But, like, mo- most movies that are sort of Scream ripoffs are doing the same thing Scream did. Eh, kind of boring and don't have much to them. But this one, which very much, I mean, this is a Dimension film. It's very much going off the Scream sort of format, even written by Kevin Williamson, who wrote Scream, uh, is different in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, so it, it is. it sticks out, and it, it has more to it, I think, than a lot of those others. It, that's the surprising thing about this for me, is like in my head, I totally had this lumped in, um, like you said, with good reason, with I Know What You Did Last Summer yeah. mm-hmm. and all those kinds of movies and stuff. And whenever it kicks off, it very much feels like, okay, I know this vibe. I know exactly what this, this scene is. I know yep. all these actors and this soundtrack and yada yada. So I kind of thought I knew what I was getting in for. I knew nothing about this movie. I thought it was <laughs> going to be another, like, okay, one of these kids is the killer or whatever. Right. And Which, then, it, I mean, it kind of is that. Kind except of, I guess. It's, one of these kids is a gigantic alien creature. <laughs> yeah. I was surprised by, like, how quickly, right out of the gate, it gets into, like, oh, no, you're watching an alien movie right yeah. now. This is, this like, is a body aliens. snatcher, yeah. pod people, alien mm-hmm. movie. Yeah. And I was absolutely not expecting that but it did automatically make me more interested in this and more focused on this than i would have been if it was another you know pseudo giallo 90s black glove killer movie yeah uh this is just not what i was expecting and uh i don't know i had some good things about it i had some bad things about it. yeah yeah i think you know i have some nostalgia for it that uh that broke a little uh on my most recent watching of it which is good makes it uh, easier to talk about it uh instead of just being like no it's so cool um i i can say for surety there are some real problems but knowing what it meant in 1998 like the shift that it kind of was even though it's just it's a minor twist was a big deal making it really stand out as being one of the more important late 90s horror movies even though now, yeah, I could see a, a good number of problems with it. Yeah, yeah. But I was just surprised to see that it was a non-human yeah. enemy in this, you know? Right. Uh, and there is just a fuck ton of people <laughs> that we all know yes. that were involved in the making of this. Like you said, the guy that fucking wrote Scream. Yeah, and Devin he Williamson. Also did, did he also do I Know What You Did Last Summer? Is that right? He did. Uh, yeah. Ben, let me just... <laughs> I need you to imagine this world because okay. this is Kevin Williamson's world in a world where Kevin in Williamson. a world where Kevin Williamson is a nobody who wrote a script of a movie that might be something. <laughs> Nineteen ninety six, when Scream came out, Kevin Williamson was nobody. By two thousand, Kevin Williamson had uh, written and produced. Five movies. He had directed Teaching Mrs. Tingle. He had created Dawson's Creek and Wasteland, two television shows, one of which lasted for several seasons. Jeez, man. I mean, seriously, like when you think about the mid late nineties, yeah. he wrote it. Like he wrote yep. the mid late nineties. Yeah, everything. Because it's not just, 20, it's not just uh, movies, I know what you, you know? did last summer, Scream. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, the Dawson's Creek bit. It, yeah. He he's his tendrils were in everything like people that were in stuff he did got into the movies that were trying to duplicate what he did <laughs> because they were like it's well get one of those kids because of course 
uh so yeah like they were trying to duplicate everything about scream and a lot of that duplication is uh dimension it is miramax being like okay we got a formula let's run with it but then of course things like urban legend and all those others are uh i know what you did last summer that's i think columbia like these are other studios trying to duplicate what miramax is doing Mm-hmm. And, and speaking yeah. of Miramax, we have to do our customary yeah, fu- fuck, fuck the Weinsteins. Well, yeah, like, <laughs> I think we've said it every time, but yeah, what, I mean, what the fuck? Come on, guys. Yeah, uh, exactly. I can't resist uh, an urge just to talk shit about them for any reason. Fuck them. Yeah. Um, but this is directed also by Robert Rodriguez, who is yeah, hot dude. at the time. Like, he had done, uh, you know... Uh, uh, Dust till dawn, Dust till mariachi, dawn. mariachi. Yeah, he had done he had done those up to this point. Uh, from Dust till dawn, it just happened a couple of years before this. So he, yeah, he's hot at the time, and then this uh, did pretty well, and then he did Spy Kids, which then got him into the that sort of Spy Kids thing for a while, which actually boosted his profile because those movies made a lot of money. <laughs> oh yeah, they did. Yeah. yeah, and this is during that time period where. You know, Miramax was really working hard to get the voice of that generation's filmmakers yeah. all in yeah. one staple. I mean, from Kevin Smith to Quentin Tarantino yep. to Robert Rodriguez. Mm-hmm. Again, it's like if if Kevin, what's his name that wrote this? Uh, Kevin Williamson. Williamson. If he if he wrote the mid late nineties, then those guys directed the mid late nineties. Yeah, yeah. They made they made the the sort of like pinnacle that all those movies were trying to duplicate. Lit, but mm-hmm. never could like nobody could make a movie as cool as from dusk till dawn for a while like everybody was just in awe of how cool robert rodriguez was as a director how cool quentin tarantino was it took a while for people to figure out how to do what they were doing yeah totally which was in a lot of ways just homage and uh making do with low budgets like oh yeah something that Rodriguez is really known for right yeah and I gotta say though man like if I didn't know that this was a Rodriguez movie I don't think I would have been like this is a really Rodriguez director this movie feels very de-stylized for him to me yeah it's it's got some coolness like some of those slick sort of moments to it but it's mostly yeah not not uh not as rodriguez as you would expect. No, uh, uh, I didn't think so. But yeah, I, I would say maybe that is... Uh, in some ways, like, I know that uh, Miramax wanted Kevin Williamson to direct this, um, and he, he turned them down. And I, I guess maybe Robert Rodriguez was taking it more as a job and less of a his sort of uh, picture. Because, like, I know with, with From Dusk Till Dawn, it's, it's extreme. I mean, that's just two years before this. It's extremely Robert Rodriguez. It's so is oh, Spy yeah. Kids. Like, mm-hmm. maybe he was just uh, like, oh, I just need to work on something right now. And, and yeah, I, I would say you're right. It doesn't have as much of a Robert Rodriguez feel to it as any of his other movies. Yeah. But, I mean, that's also, too, because so much of the Rodriguez feel is, like, him doing everything. Like, him right. getting yeah. his favorite actors and stuff in it. Him getting his soundtrack well, and, I, and stuff in the movie like and this movie just doesn't really have any of those things i think yeah well you got selma hayek in for sure <laughs> i would imagine. oh and also too like towards the the first of the movie where um shit there's a close-up of like a latina girl sitting on a stoop she's like kind of punk or goth looking yeah yeah the girl with the the nose ring uh-huh. yeah that's like his fuck is it like sister nephew niece somebody oh, is it? Like, he's related <laughs> to her i said nephew that's funny that's his nephew that girl's that's his nephew. nephew oh yeah. okay no that's some family member of his apparently oh that's cool i didn't know that yeah i mean the thing is that like looking at the names in this that they're connected to like so many people in this were either in she's all that or um fuck what's the the other one Oh, why can't I think of it? Uh, can't hardly wait. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So many people involved in this, or and she's all that, or can't hardly wait, or other movies uh, are like that. Like, but but they're all early in their career, so it's like the it's almost like Miramax just picked the who's who of who they thought would be somebody, 
And they kind of yeah. nailed it with most of them. <laughs> like, yeah, they actually did. They should have bought a lottery yeah. ticket the day they cast this fucking movie because they were yeah. kind of right all over the place. And this yeah. is a lot of returning faces and names for the podcast. I mean, I was thinking about oh, it yeah. and I was like, mm-hmm. we've done, um, you know, Planet Terror and right. Dust Till Dawn yeah. by Robert yeah. Rodriguez. We've covered Lord of the Rings with Elijah Wood. We've done uh-huh. 30 Days of Night with Josh Hartnett. Josh Hartnett, yeah. Uh, there's a couple other in here that overlapped like that too. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there, there definitely. I, I saw a few, but yeah, uh, yeah. Piper Laurie was the mom and Carrie. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Who, who we've talked about there? Frasier a lot, and Lilith is in this. Oh yeah, that's true. We have talked about <laughs> Frasier a lot, and Lilith <laughs> is in this. And I didn't realize, um, like, when I was a kid, I thought Lilith was supposed to not be hot. And then when I saw this movie as a teenager, I was like, wait, Lilith's hot? Yeah. Hold on yeah. a second. <laughs> totally, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, who else was in this, though, that, that was in something else? Um, Selma Hayek is also in From Dust Till Dawn. And yeah. <laughs> oh, we've also talked. This, this is a little surprise to me. I just did not realize. But you know the fa- the couple that's always fighting in the background? The yeah, one the, where the whole movie. They're just like yeah. fucking tearing each other up. What's up yeah, with that? So- so the boyfriend in that is the guy who plays the Skeet Ulrich role in Scary Movie. What? <laughs> what? I was like, dude, what? And the girl is Summer Phoenix. Joaquin and, and uh, River Phoenix's sister. What the fuck? Yeah, so I imagine, again, this might be Robert Rodriguez. Like, oh, these are just friends of mine thing. And like, just sticking them in there in like yeah, very minor, yeah. unobtrusive roles. Yeah. So while it doesn't like it doesn't gleam as a Robert Rodriguez movie, I think there's still some little touches there. But yeah, but that's yeah, a very Rodriguez is, move. Yeah, it is really. Um, I think in a lot of ways, like uh, the wine scene's probably trying to capture coolness. Basically, like they're like, okay, we'll get Robert Rodriguez, we'll get Kevin Williamson, we'll get all these people we know that are up and coming and have been in these roles that have been cool we'll try to just make this movie cool and i think it worked in 1998 and then watching it now and listening to it like listening to what they say (laughs) and seeing how the story progresses i'm like oh it's really it's not cool it did capture a moment but it's not like a it's not a moment that is evergreen it's not always gonna be cool it's yeah uh, it's really not as cool as I remember. And and a lot of the stuff, a lot of the dialogue to me is just, ugh. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, There's some pretty dreadful mm, stuff in there, man. That's rough, yeah. <laughs> I, I still have a lot of love for this movie. Well, the thing about it is, though, is like if you came to me and told me, hey, there's a movie that you've never seen that is like a combination of Body Snatchers, The Thing, and The Breakfast Club. Right. Sounds I'd be great. like, uh, why am I not watching that right yeah. now? And that really is exactly what this movie is. It kind of does ape the whole, you know, um, the people that you know might not be the people you know. They could be yeah. aliens in disguise. Plus, there's yeah. the whole suspicion of who is the alien. But then there's also all these little character archetypes in the high school framework of the Breakfast Club. Like, right. it's such an ideal, fun setup. I think it could have been more fun. Definitely. Yeah. But on paper, that's a winning combination. Oh, yeah, on paper, it's a winning combination for sure. And it, it definitely did win at the time. Like, it stuck with so many of us. I've heard so many people say, like, oh, The Faculty. Like, I loved that movie. Uh, and I I don't want to ruin that for anybody. I don't think... Uh, and I don't think anything I'm going to say will do that. Because, honestly, um, what, uh, you said Breakfast Club. People still love The Breakfast Club. The most recent time I watched The Breakfast Club, I was like, oh, this dialogue. <laughs> yeah and there's also like, some real problematic shit in that movie. yeah there is <laughs> but the breakfast club explores character in a, a, a way that still works whereas this doesn't <laughs> like this does not get into any depth of character at all in fact i'd say some of the characters are kind of interchangeable and don't really have like i mean other than southern what are what are the others characters we got the guy who is uh cool a rebel and smart he's all of those things <laughs> yeah he's kind of a little bit of everything yeah uh we've got the the nerdy guy 
Elijah the, Wood. The nerdy guy who's not necessarily smart. Yeah. He's true. nerdy because he is. He's like, shy? I guess. Oh, you don't see him being very shy. Every time he's talking to one of the people involved, he seems to talk, speak his mind. I, That's true. Yeah. Don't know uh, why we he's also a nerd. have the new girl in school who has borrowed Clarice Starling's southern accent. She did. She was like, I'll take that for a second. Hello, can turn, agent Can Clarice you turn that Starling? on yourself, Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> Her accent is so dead yeah. on, just like Jodie Foster's, dude. <laughs> I... I I don't know if she is Southern, though. I think actually she might be. <laughs> I don't want to don't say know. for sure, because I know, I, I think in Dead Like Me, she also does a Southern accent. Dead oh, really? Dead Like Me was a pretty cool show. Huh. Uh, nope, she is from Canada. So, yeah, oh, you're right. Holy shit, man. <laughs> huh, she's going all Shania Twain on us here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <she is. laughs> we've also got of course the bitchy popular faux cheerleader girl in here yeah jordana brewster uh who was the soap opera actress before this oh, uh, okay but also well known for being in the fast and the furious franchise uh ah yeah yeah uh she her character is uh, head cheerleader who is also the editor of the school newspaper and also just mean to everybody yeah seems that way mm -hmm. but uh, you know what steve really at the end of the day she's a bitch she's a right. mother she's a child yeah she's a lover she's a sinner, she's a sinner she's and a saint, a saint. <laughs> she doesn't feel ashamed I love that everyone under 30 listening has no fucking idea what yeah. we're talking about. <laughs> and then everybody Google. over 30 just it's paused to blast that song. <laughs> Hang on. Got to listen to that song again <laughs> real quick here. <laughs> yeah, Jordana Brewster. I mean, uh, you know, it, I, I don't think any of these actors do a bad job. I think they all do a good job. They proved yeah. that they are good. Uh, it's just that the characters are like, couldn't they have made Stokely the editor of the newspaper? Instead of the real-life lesbian playing a straight girl pretending oh, to be a lesbian. Can you imagine how hard that had to be for Clea Duvall? The, she has to play a character who pretends to be a lesbian so people will leave her alone. Like, and also, too, like, dude, getting the direction of, you know, be all mean to men like lesbians are. Yeah. <laughs> Like, that's the direction what? that she probably got. Don't worry, a man will come along and cure you of your desire to wear black. <laughs> what? That does happen. It does happen. <laughs> I mean, the the most shoehorned part of the ending to me was Elijah Wood and Jordana Brewster being a Why? couple. I was Why? like, oh, no. Dude, that the ending happen. of this movie made... No fucking sense. I can it's see like that suddenly in real everybody's life happening up. because Elijah Wood's a successful actor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in in this case, I can't see Jordana Brewster, who looks like a gorgeous model, mm -hmm. being like, I'm going to get with this guy for some reason. This guy with a camera around his neck all the yeah, time. Yeah, who has no personality except, I'm a nerd, guys, huh? <laughs> Dude, it makes no sense. At the end of the movie, when it shows that they're like a happy couple or whatever... Like, there was no indication at any point over the whole course of the movie that she was ever into him or, like, no. nice that, to him or he was into her or anything. Well that, it was just like, they're a couple because it's the end of the movie. Bye. I haven't seen it a lot of times, I would say. I think they do put some small flirtations in coming from him that I guess if you try to read her as flirting back, you could, but she's talking to him the same way she talks to everybody, so she could be flirting with everybody. If that's, yeah. <laughs> if that's flirting, I, I don't know. Uh, Dude, but that's not more puzzling than the other relationship that we get where <laughs> I guess it somehow just becomes socially acceptable and okay for Josh Hartnett uh -huh. to be just in an open relationship with Fomka Phoenix, yeah. Yeah. who's there like watching football practice fucking yeah. winking and smiling at him and stuff. And it's and just like, for oh, some you know, is all Johnny, our quarterback. now. Yeah, and then everybody yeah. on the team is like, you know, Johnny, the quarterback who fucks that teacher at school, right? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Like, what the fuck is going on there? You know, the 19-year-old drug dealer that up until a month ago was in no way involved with sports? 
Yeah. Yeah. He's what? playing football now. Oh, and guess what? Fucking Fomka Jensen, who's a teacher here. <laughs> what? <laughs> How is I, that a, a happy ending for this guy? I don't I don't get it, man. I mean, yeah. I, I, so, but then again, this is also kind of probably in that age where it was yeah. just like, oh, this hot teacher fucked one of her students. Nice. Uh, yeah, this is this is the year after Mary Kay Letourneau, uh, Ooh, which was uh. the big ho- pro- high profile '90s teacher fucking a twelve year old, uh, raping a twelve year old. Uh, yeah, let's be honest. Type of stories, yeah, and yeah, I remember I was in high school and uh, we all joked around. <laughs> what if it was this teacher? Well. I mean, we didn't have a teacher at our high school that everybody was like, I want to have sex with that teacher, which is an unfortunate experience to not get. That's another tradition of back to school. Oh, yeah? (laughs) Which of the teachers are we going to want to fuck this this year? year. (laughs) (laughs) God, humans are weird. But yeah, now as uh, an adult, it would be like, oh, that would have been a bad thing. Can you imagine? Like the (laughs) the stunted adult that has sex with a teenager? Yeah. Mm, weird. Yeah, be good. No. Yeah. So, but yeah, I think it's playing with that Mary Kay Letourneau thing, uh, and it's doing that like, ha ha ha. We'd all like that. Did Did I miss something, or did we not see her severed head crawling around as a spider like ten minutes earlier yeah. in the movie? Well, the I mean, she got I, better. I I can I can get with that. I mean, uh, if the aliens can heal the body, then. Why would she be dead? Because she's her head she's was really off. That. Yeah, but the the alien creature it doesn't kill the alien creature, and I guess it could heal the body back. Obviously, since it did. I guess. And they all like it. Yeah, but there's I mean there's question there. I mean like when at the end Elijah Wood has those worms crawling into him, and then they all just fall out, and then his face is fine. Like he'd have huge gashes. It, it, That's it's true. Like the premise is that the alien can heal them up quickly, but the alien's not in him anymore, so he's just got his regular old healing to do. Hmm. Unless he's a Wolverine. Oh yeah, that's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Hmm. Well, I'm glad her head came back. That's yeah. <laughs> convenient. It was convenient for her head to come back. I mean, Do you think they ever sit down and talk about like, hey, you remember when your head was off? Yeah, that's crazy. I wonder if she does remember. Boy, that'd be wild, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would talk about that a lot if that were the case. My wife's head was off once, I'd say. <laughs> oh, also, she was my teacher in high school. <laughs> anyway, back to my wife's head being off. Like Wait, you start what, with the wife's head off. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to start with the wife's head off. So when you say that she was your teacher in high school, they're like, no, no, no. But the head thing. Yeah. Like it's like a, <laughs> more about that, please. Yeah, shock and awe. So they don't really absorb the fact that a nineteen-year-old and I don't know twenty-something. How old was Fomka Jensen here? Maybe I don't know. Twenty-two, twenty-three. I don't know. Dude, I'll tell you this though. I do think there's just too many darn characters in this movie. Yeah, there's there are kind a, lot. Of a lot. There are a lot. Yeah, I mean, we have we have uh what like five teachers that yeah. are well, I guess some Hayek's not a teacher, but you know, five of them and then you've How got many kids are there? There's like parents. six or seven? Yeah, there's like six or seven kids plus Usher uh, Plus Usher, that's yeah, right. Usher's in there giving everybody herpes. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else? Oh, we got the parents. So you know, Shooter McGavin comes in. I guess after his yep. morning breakfast of shit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You eat shit for breakfast. And then, of course, <laughs> uh, 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 alleged rapist Danny Masterson. Oh, uh, confirmed Ooh. Scientologist. So, oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. but in in uh, he has been arrested just last month for really three counts of rape. So Whoa. I'm gonna go with rapist. I'm gonna go with fuck that guy. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. There's so many characters in this, and I mean, who? I mean, not many people die, but some people do die. Yeah, yeah. There's right? a couple deaths and stuff in there. Oh yeah, and yeah. John Stewart too. <laughs> yeah, John. Yes, John Stewart with a, a ill-advised goatee. It just does not work for him. No, man. it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. I mean, it's this not is the look. 
this is crazy though like just looking at the imdbs of all these people this is the year before he gets the daily show like oh wow so like this is the john stewart we could have if he had never gotten the daily show he we i mean think of the roles he did he did this he did uh big daddy like mm, half we could have isn't never that? known how awesome john stewart is if he hadn't gotten the daily show that's true man that's yeah. very very true huh but yeah, overall, like, there's a lot of these characters, and I get that they were going for, I think, kind of a, a little bit of a reversal of the archetypes that we saw in, like, The Breakfast Club, because, yeah. you know, as, as we know, even though those kinds of roles of the jock, the cheerleader, the artist, the goth, sure. whatever. Those can exist, yeah. Even though we know of those from movies and stuff like that, it's like, oftentimes when you get to know those people in real life, yeah, they're, they're not like that. They're not that yeah. one-dimensional. Yeah. Some you know? people are. Some people really buy sure. into that for sure. I mean, from my experience, though, uh, somebody who uh, played sports and also hung out with the metal kids and uh, smoked a lot of weed. Uh, I, I knew a lot of people across the gamut. There are very few people that I would say fit any sort of archetype. So, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's it, you already sort of lose out in having characters like that by 1998 like i think scream had more compelling characters right like scream's characters each had some sort of personality yeah like, and they were a little less pigeonholed into being one box yeah. or or another you know yeah so yeah i think by 1998 we should have a little more character development i mean spread out some of that stuff i mean i, I josh hartnett can be handsome and smart that's fine but why does he why is he also the rebel drug dealer? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the thing about this that the more I thought about it, the more I realized like it had to have been on purpose that they took these things that look like very surface level character archetypes and then over the course of the movie everybody kind of reverses their character archetype in yeah. some way. Like for example, Elijah Wood, the shy camera kid, yeah. is the guy that gets the big action yeah, he's the line hero. Uh -huh. beat at the end. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've got well, even the jock wants to be the nerd. He wants to quit playing sports and stuff yeah. like that. You yeah. know, all he's trying to do is to quit the swim team and football and blah blah blah. Um our and the head popular cheerleader, cheerleader doesn't want to be with the the jock. She wants to be with the nerd. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Yeah. So but it's like it there's all like these she little wants reversals. to be with whoever gets all the attention. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Is everybody is kind of yeah, because very much uh, Stokely at the end is a completely different person. That makes no sense. Yeah, like, that's no the reversal sense, yeah. where it's just like, okay, so your arc reversal is that you just denied everybody who you were the whole movie? Yeah. Yeah, it's Good weird. Good story arc. Cool. Yeah. But, it, I mean, it, do, it does work, too, with finding out that the person who basically started it all, the queen of the aliens is this sweet person who's been accepting and loving and, and really, like, just a good person the whole time. I mean, so, I don't know. I, I think that that whole arc with her character is there to sow distrust among aliens, people from other counties. <gasps> Go back to where you come from. You're an alien. I know it. <laughs> you you are not from this county. Your McDonald's you. is not across the street from your Walmart. How am I supposed to get around? Mm -hmm, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, d I do think, I mean, you know, anytime you're doing Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you're you're talking about the fears of uh, both uh, a change in ideology in your government or a change in uh, 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 racial dominance in a country. So when you present that element, like what what is this alien representing for us? Like, is she... Is she the uh, is she communism? Are we supposed to be scared of communism? Is she uh, the, the Latin American integration or uh, immigration? Is that what we're worried about? Like, what is the alien representing in this? Right. You know, and that's an interesting point too, because especially considering we're just talking about those character archetypes not really being on the inside the way they might appear on the outside. Yeah. Even that in itself is kind of a a pod person body snatcher. Yeah. You know, fear typically, but in this it's kind of presented as a positive where it's like, yeah. yeah, this person looks like this on the outside, but it's actually a different person on the inside. Yeah. Like that that in itself is kind of like even a soft 
pod person reveal that these characters yeah. aren't who we think they are you know yeah. only so, it's done in a positive sort of way it is yeah and it's more of a yeah it's more of a teenage coming of age type of story in that way breakfast club style uh yeah. so yeah then uh the alien like the problem is that the mask the alien uh is putting on is accepting mm -hmm. when what it wants is conformity so that's what I think is ultimately that's at, the, the at the core is of this conformity. Yeah, conformity. Yeah, because especially too, like the notion of setting a movie like this in this you know pod person style yeah. in a high school is such a perfect setting because you know conformity and fitting in and all that kind of thing is, uh, from what I understand, <laughs> very present yeah. in the public school system and stuff. So sure, sure it is. Yeah, the I mean, notion it, to set a a you know body snatcher movie in a high school. I think is really, really good, actually. I think that's every bit as good yeah. as, you know, the, the the Things premise of a body snatcher movie set on this Arctic base where all these guys are trapped in a little, you know, base with each other trying to figure out who's the alien and stuff. Yeah, I think uh, this is I think strong. That's good. I think this is strong on idea, but not in execution in a lot of ways. But still I executed well, but just not not to the point where it, where it really makes many of the points that it's trying to. I think so too, man. This is yeah. one of those ones where if somebody was like, yeah, we're going to take another swing at the faculty, I think I would actually be like, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Cause uh -huh. the first one was more of a, you know, more of a bunt really, because again, yeah. it's like using what I said earlier about like, it's the thing plus the breakfast club in a high school. It's about conformity. I'm like, fuck yeah. Sign me yeah, up. That's, that's interesting. a great idea. Yeah. I, yeah. I do think they could have just taken a lot of these ideas and themes further, though. Yeah, yeah. It do it doesn't it doesn't ever get deep enough. So like the the scenes like where they're basically duplicating the thing <laughs> with with the drug. Um, oh man, yeah, very heavy handed. That whole scene of yeah. like we all got to do this thing to prove that none of us yeah. is the alien. You're like, okay, so exactly like the thing. Got it. Yeah, and and the thing is that's fine. It's fine to do this alien thing, but the problem is what you've done instead of setting up the tension like the thing does and then developing the tension through character so that when we get to that scene, the tension's already there. This movie fails at that. So when we're yeah. in the scene, basically they're like, okay, so we should have everybody do this drug to prove you're not an alien. And everybody's like, yeah. And then he's like, all right. And then everyone individually says, not me, though. And here's why. <laughs> I can't do this drug yeah, because and it's like, these reasons. It's like there's no tension there. It's like, oh, okay, I get we're trying to find out is one of us an alien. But, like, I'm not even buying into the idea that one of them is. Yeah. Because, yeah, like, in the thing, it's like one of them has to be. With them, it's like, well, one of them doesn't have to be. Yeah, they they're in a school. There's like hundreds aliens. of kids there. Yes. Yeah, so, that yeah, scene, just man, failed. just felt very heavy-handed. And I swear to God, it's got to be like realistically so like 12 to 15 it's minutes so long. long. Yeah. And really, yeah. honestly, too, I mean, the Things blood test scene is also very long. But yeah. that movie, as we discussed the when we reviewed there, it, yeah. the tension's there, the claustrophobia, yep. the fact that there is no escape, even if, mm -hmm. you know, you wanted to get away, you can't. You're in the fucking, fucking Arctic, you know? And you know that the result is going to definitely be that one of them is infected. Like, Yeah, the odds are movie, there. The movie just sets this up in the scene suddenly. It's like, okay, suddenly we're pretty sure one of us is an alien probably, right? <laughs> yeah, but there I is guess. a possibility that among the hundreds of kids at our school, one of us might be of this group uh. of six or seven people so let's spend a yeah. long time deliberating and taking jesse spano caffeine pills because we're so <laughs> excited we're so scared I, listen emily and i were talking about this last night there I, there's no recreational use for caffeine aside from the ways you already get it like yeah. taking <laughs> way more caffeine than you normally would take is not a good time it's not no. fun Mm, and know. it's not like the same as like fucking cocaine or something like that. That's no. a true upper. Yeah. So, I, I listen movies. Let's two tropes we have to get rid of. One of those tropes is making up a drug. 
just yeah. don't. Oh, yeah. There's always that. In this movie, it's scat. <laughs> yeah, just don't. It's I shit. I thought maybe that the was Jinkum. Of shit. You know, like, it, it's calling it scat. Maybe it's <laughs> yeah. Jinkum. It's just a bag of his yeah, own piss and shit go. that's been fuming up <laughs> for days. <laughs> if you don't know but, what I'm talking about, don't Google Jinkum. You don't even want to. Yeah, no, you do not. Just need don't. To. Yeah. So that's a problem. But my major problem in this scene is the concept of the chemistry prodigy. Now, Dude, some people are just born with it, man. Yeah, may, maybe maybe it's Maybelline. Who knows? <laughs> but here's the thing. There are certain things you can be a prodigy of. There are definitely geniuses who are very capable of learning certain subjects very easily. Sure. But this is a guy who is at best 19, goes to public school. So anything he's learned, he's learned on his own. And doesn't seem to be trying too hard to learn this, but Anytime something comes up, he's the expert to, on the subject. That's like, true. And he knows how to put together these chemicals. Now, li- seriously, you set a musical prodigy in front of a piano. You come back in an hour. They'll probably be able to play something. Mm-hmm. You set someone you think is a chemistry prodigy in front of a bunch of chemicals that they don't know. They will get nothing out of it. Yeah, it's like, here's some liquids and powders and stuff. Uh, yes. See what you can do with it. There There's is no logicking your way through <laughs> that. There's no prodigying no. your way no. towards a chemical reaction. Chemistry is about well-documented knowledge of certain chemicals. Like, it is not about knowledge that you could pull out of your brain out of nowhere from right. observing <laughs> the world around you. So there's no such thing as a chemistry prodigy. Nobody who... Uh, who doesn't know about a computer system can sit down at a computer and just hack. That's just not a thing. Nobody is a computer prodigy. You have (laughs) to learn these things. (laughs) I'm just saying, like, we got to get rid of these characters who are prodigies at things that you could not be a prodigy at. Some people are really (laughs) smart and good and learn those things early, but it's not a prodigy. It's just a person who focused on a thing and learned it. Like, you learned to guitar. Yeah. You may be very good at it. Were you good at it immediately? No. Exactly. <laughs> hey, but Steve, I had the advantage of the fact that I was blessed. That's true. Ble- oh. Yeah, was blessed. That is like, isn't that like the biggest insult? It's when the biggest att- insult. Yeah, attribute yes. your talent to God when it's like... Yeah. W- I am the one sitting down doing this. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, a, a gift by definition is something that someone gives you for nothing in return. But I seem to recall tens of thousands of hours <laughs> yeah, of that working. I spent on my own to get it. I don't think that's a gift, yeah. technically. I yeah. think that that's something that you earned. Yeah. Jamie Call Lannister said that, didn't he? <laughs> Wasn't that a thing he said? Probably. Somebody, yeah, yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> it's not a gift. I work at it. Yeah. He shredded a sword. That's a right. Shaba. But yeah, so that's, that scene is rough for a lot of reasons for me. Uh, and specifically, it's just like, okay, like they all seemed to be on board with, yeah, that's right. That's a good alien test. We, yeah, that's what we <laughs> should do. All right. But not me, though. And he yeah, yeah, why. no, no, no. I can't do it. I got, yeah. I got reasons. I'm daring to resist drugs. I'm allergic. I'm Portuguese. <laughs> How are you allergic to a thing you've never done? That's yeah. not a thing. No. I don't <laughs> and think that's a also, thing. also, the way it shows that she didn't do it, everybody oh, would have seen. Everybody would have fucking seen that. <laughs> Yeah, there's that little replay thing at the end of like, oh, no, I flicked open the cap with my little tentacle finger and all the powder <laughs> fell out on the floor. It's like everybody was somebody staring when she did it. I understand yeah. that. Didn't she do it last, I guess? Because Jordan and Brewster didn't do it. So I guess everybody else, the assumption would be, oh, they're on the drug, so they aren't paying attention, maybe. Really? Because, like, caffeine tends to make you hyper yeah, aware. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure they'd all be like, what the, What was you with your tentacle finger and all the powders all over you now? Wait a second. Yeah, and in reality, they all should have started talking like they were on Gilmore Girls. That's true. Yeah. All that fast talking, <laughs> yeah. all them quips and yeah, pop culture references. True. 
<laughs> they should have sounded like Lorelei. <laughs> yeah, and also, too, I just don't understand how he can apparently be such a fucking genius and have a haircut that looks like goddamn Simple Jack. Dude, I don't know what they were going for. and If it was uh, uh, Dumb and Dumber inspired or what was... <laughs> like, like, there was that thing of, like, bedhead for a while. It was just like, oh, yeah. fucking push pomade into your hair and just push it every which direction. Like, you just rolled out of bed. No, sure. he, he looked like his fucking mom cut haircut. his hair. Yeah. And she was uh, probably blind. <laughs> his blind mother cut his hair. And he's really proud of it. He's like, yeah, my exactly. mom did it. Don't talk she about it. it. But also, too, like, is there sort of a pro-drugs message in this movie <laughs> it does seem to hinge drugs on the existence the of drugs and how drugs will keep you from being a conformed alien monster right because at yeah. the end of the day drugs are the winner hey man i've been saying that for years <laughs> you're just ahead of the curve here man yeah uh, yeah i don't yeah. know like here's the thing that i think about though you know is that Especially with the the conformity message, and and there's obviously some very heavy-handed use of Pink Floyd cover songs on the soundtrack that we'll talk about here in a second, too. But, you know, obviously the message of conformity and these teachers trying to make all the students into little clones of themselves and stuff is is very present in the movie. I kind of do like that at the end of the day, what, you know, saves our heroes at the end of the movie is a skill that this guy learned on his own like it's really more about like his skills that he learned outside of school and using his own natural talents as a chemistry prodigy or what Mm -hmm. saved the day not what he learned in school the same as everyone else it's about our individual gifts steve yeah yeah and that's a very kind of gen x sort of message where it's it's just like real important to let people know you can learn stuff outside of school you know Whoa. It's like all, all the rest of us who've had the internet for a good portion of our life are like, yeah, uh-huh, <laughs> you can. That's, yep, it's true. But in 1998, like, to you had to tell an entire generation, like, yeah, hey, look, I know school was boring, but there actually is interesting stuff to learn. Mm-hmm. And, like, uh, that, that that was, I do remember in the 90s, reading books so much more because it was that desire to learn and also the internet not either not existing or not really existing in a way where you can get a whole lot of information out of it Mm -hmm. um reading was a big thing like it was and in some many ways a non-conforming thing so the message of this actually it, it does work so well for its time I just think it it hasn't aged exactly very well because I think a lot of those concerns just aren't as present anymore. Like, I don't know how much conformity is an issue anymore. Yeah, I would think that like, and and again, this is just fucking two guys that haven't. Been yeah, we in don't have kids. We don't long. go to school, uh, so yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But I would imagine, yeah, the existence of social media and even just the fact that being a nerd is cool now like the fact that yeah, everybody plays video games and some people yeah. play sports and it's just being an individual is the thing now yeah yeah so like maybe that's not as much of an issue as it was for us so yeah. maybe this is one of those movies where you know young kids would watch this now and completely not get it i don't know yeah i mean the people you hear complaining about conformity now are the people calling everyone sheep for wearing masks oh, like, jesus christ man I, and it's a holdover from this. This this was their teenagehood. This was them like growing up. Like conformity was the the big bugaboo. Like that was the thing to be afraid of. And yeah, I just don't think it's as big a worry anymore because people you can find your own niche audiences and your own groups and stuff very easily online. And it can just be yeah. like, oh well, yeah. I mean, people at school don't do this, but thousands of other people do tons this, other so. people do yeah this yeah. is not unusual for me to be into yeah. being a furry or whatever it is yeah, whatever, into, you know? yeah yeah so yeah i think it, i think it's probably less of an issue now but i bet there's probably still some good bit of that uh, i mean you know children 
children are always going through that societal hierarchical learning sort of thing where they're trying, they're trying to, to find who they are you know who they are in the world and how they connect with other people and it's you know it's not until you get into adulthood that you really come to understand like oh none of, none of that is set in stone you can be who you want to be but you know as a kid a lot of that is learning like what what are the rules see let's go back and talk about the drug of choice a little bit right here because what the kids mm -hmm. figure out is that oh, these yeah. aliens unlike mm -hmm. the aliens that we see in m night Shyamalan's signs they right. love themselves some woda they oh, always they gotta water. be drinking they abd always be <laughs> drinking yeah. They got to have themselves that H2O. And what they figure out is that caffeine is an extremely mild diuretic. So that should do the job, right? Yeah, that'll do it. That'll dry them right out in a second. I mean, diuretics. Maybe this is a, a like connection to Dianetics. Ooh, I like where that's going. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing, man. It's like, yeah, like caffeine will dehydrate you a little bit, but. Have you ever heard sure. of this stuff called salt? Because I think that that yeah. extracts moisture way, way more and is mm -hmm. very plentiful and easily accessible. Or the chlorinated water of a pool. Uh, I looked you it know up last what? night. The pH of uh, pool water is is going to dry you out more than caffeine. So <laughs> You don't say, but at one yeah. point, the alien is in the pool and stuff. So. Yeah, completely immersed in the pool, yeah. Huh. Seems like that yeah, should have done it in. Yeah. I think they should have cut the bit about it being a diuretic. Like, they should just be like, I don't know why it works. That would have been fine. It works because there's fucking shit in this. It's made out of rat poison yeah. and Drano and what yeah, the fuck that, ever, that's right? What he could have, yeah, that's all they ha he could have been like, oh, it's just caffeine and some, some, uh, household cleaners and stuff. And then they'd be like, oh, I don't, I don't know why it works, but it does. Yeah, it'll get you fucked up. <laughs> Guaranteed to jack you up. Yeah. And the yeah. thing is, though, is like, honestly, again, this kind of goes into like, if there ever was a second swing at this, if the shit that, that, you know, he was making and the kids take and have to take to prove that they're not the aliens is some kind of tremendous fuck you up, like super meth kind of shit. Uh huh. And they spend, you know, the last third of the movie basically hopped up on like PCP out of their minds tripping <laughs> balls getting wet like, yeah yeah dude like adrenaline just going crazy and stuff the whole time now that is a movie i'd want to fucking see they're like yeah. ripping the aliens apart with their bare yeah. hands and shit oh man their that faces. sounds great they're on they're basically on bath salts it's basically just set in florida it's just another tuesday in florida it's a boring movie <laughs> have you is, is it abc's of horror i believe it's abc's of horror it might be abc's of horror or death abc's of death two the the b is bath salts <laughs> and you gotta you gotta see that short it's it's so funny uh, hell yeah yeah that, yeah they that would have been amazing though to see them hopped up on drugs ripping an alien apart um yeah <laughs> i could i could deal with that for sure i'd be okay with that yeah the fact that it's like caffeine which is sort of an inert element in this stuff that he's making yeah. and that's what shuts the aliens down is it's kind of weak. Again, I think that the ending of this movie, just in general, is kind of weak. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the the overly hap uh, happy ending. It is a questionably happy ending for me, but I think they're trying to say it's a happy ending. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't work. But even all. like the last scenes where we end up with, you know, Elijah Wood as our, our final boy, and he's... right being chased through the bleachers by the alien and uh -huh. stuff and then he yeah that's he has a that classic like, you know what is it this will jack you up and then he stabs uh, yeah. it in the eye or whatever uh -huh. it's a little underwhelming i think i mean there's it some is. cool parts to it i guess like i actually like the design of the alien quite a lot oh, yeah it's pretty neat yeah, kind of lovecrafty and I, yeah and I, and I think the cg looks fine it's not great but it's 1998 and it they only spent 15 fine. million on this so that makes sense uh, yeah. but it uh, you know, it it does have some moments like uh, say uh, the cutting off of the fingers looks great, but then the awesome. fingers crawling, eh. not great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of those movies where you do kind of have that juxtaposition of high level great practical effects by Greg Nicotero yeah, and his yeah, crew. Yeah, uh huh. 
looking great. And then that's like right next door to some early CGI that is not that fantastic. <laughs> yeah, but it's okay. I mean, I, it's fun. It's got that Men in Black sort of feel to it. Is it does. what I thought. It kind of yeah. kind of reminded me of Men in Black, which was fine. Um, but yeah, it, I think yeah. It, you were saying if they decided to remake this movie, you wouldn't be too upset about it. I'm the same. I think you could improve the script, uh, get some improved CGI, but stick with that kind of design because the design is good. You're, I mean, the you're right up the alley with Lovecraftian like. We have no idea what this creature's planet is like from yeah. looking at it. Like, it's just like, what is this? Yeah, it's like it, this alien fish creature thing that mm-hmm, can kind with of evolve. tentacles and, yeah. Like, I like the design just fine, and I like the, the way it doesn't have eyes, so you're like, uh-huh. I don't know where this thing is looking or how yeah. it's seeing me. It's very alien-like in that way, I guess. And it had those, like... It was like feelers on the side of its mouth that it used to pull back its lips so its proboscis could come out, which isn't yeah. practical, but was cool. It was yeah, definitely it was pretty a cool, cool bit. Yeah. Yeah. I really like too. There's that one scene where like right after they, you know, discover it or whatever, and John Stewart like puts it in the fish tank and mm-hmm. Goth girl like puts her hand on the fish tank and it extends those little like veins. Yeah, the little tendrils. Yeah. Yeah, tendrils out and it like exactly mimics the shape of her hand. I was like, okay, that's actually pretty yeah, fucking cool. cool. I like the yeah. idea that it's subtly mimicking her form automatically. Yeah. Uh, that's like cool exposition without us sitting down with some scientist being like, listen, we've been tracking it for years. It mimics right. everything by using these tendril things and blah, blah, blah. It's just like, oh, okay, it shows it to you right there. It mimics the form that it's close to. Um, I like that about it. I think there's yeah. a lot of good things going on with the design. And, and like you said, like there's some great special effects scenes and kills and stuff in here. Even there at the first of the movie where we get you know Lilith fighting for her life and she gets that like yeah. pencil through her hand and stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that looks a really great. cool bit. Yeah. Uh, John Stewart getting fucking stabbed in the eye looks pretty good. Oh man, yeah, that application worked really well. Like it, it just looked like he had actually been stabbed in the eye. So, uh, yeah, I think all the practical effects look great. The CG, of course, a little dated is gonna be, but it works for the film. So yeah, overall, no complaints on on that side. Uh, I'll tell you one of the CG effects that looked really good to me that I actually had to like rewind twice where I was like, okay, that's actually really subtly done. That's cool. There's the part towards the end of the movie where the big alien monster is in the pool mm-hmm. and the the water is like kind of being darkened by, I guess, just all the sludge on the creature or whatever. And it swims to one end of the pool and emerges oh, yeah. as the, the naked chick. Yes. That transition is is That's like cool. shockingly yeah. well done. It's hard yeah. to tell where the alien creature ends and like the naked chick begins. Yeah. 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 That's very well done. Uh, yeah. I, I liked that. I like that transition a lot. Let's talk for a second about that soundtrack. Dude, I'm confused by it a little bit. Not, yeah, not, me that, too. I'm, not that I have a problem with it. That offspring song is fine. Um, the, it has, a few that originals. Pink Floyd cover. It has a bunch of covers. Lots of covers in here, yeah. Creed covering Alice uh, Cooper, <laughs> which <laughs> mm, I can deal with that. Yeah, 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 that didn't need to happen, I don't think. Yeah, but Ben, I was uh, impressed by a song on here and then impressed to find out uh, who it came from. So the, the wall... Um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Pink cover. Floyd. Yeah, mm-hmm. the Pink Floyd cover, Another Brick in the Wall, is by Class of 99, Ben. Okay, and I had I never like, heard of this. Who is Class of 99? So I looked it up. Vocalist Lane Staley. Oh, from lead Alice guitar- in Chain. Yeah, lead guitarist Tom Morello. Oh, from Rage Against a Machine. Yeah, and then we got the drummer Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction, mm. Martin Lenoble from Porno for Pyros. Never uh, heard of any of these bands. <laughs> yeah. So they apparently just formed to do this. What? That's it? Like, it's I never a- heard about this. Like, there's all those other 90s super groups like Temple of the Dog and shit like that that we all know. But yeah. this, I had never heard of. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So 
I, I don't know if anybody knows of any more class of 99 stuff i i'd like to know but uh pretty good cover of of another brick in the wall i think so it's actually yeah. not all that bad i mean not yeah. shocking considering who's involved yeah exactly lane Staley, great voice so yeah. I, I i don't know why they went with that though why did they go with these covers of like 70s particular... songs mostly yeah. it's like not even relevant music for this time period they chose for yeah. like older covers i'm not really sure about that now i'm not complaining about it because we when we talked about scream we specifically complained about how the music was very 90s but didn't really convey anything for the movie like <laughs> yeah i think i think some of this like another brick in the wall certainly works in theme with the movie but some of it's just like well we could get creed to do alice cooper what? and it'll be nice why why yeah that i'm not really sure about yeah but anyway i i didn't hate it and then of course there's the 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 what do you call it the score stuff which yeah it's I, by the same guy that did scream i guess yeah, so Marco it makes Beltrami, sense that it's yeah. it's very hitchcocky it's very yeah. like high suspense orchestral score i like the original soundtrack parts a lot actually yeah. i thought it actually yeah. brought a lot of drama and a lot of tension to those scenes so i was okay with that uh i i yeah i think that it it does just what it does in scream which is uh sets a good tone i mean the I think in Scream and Scream 2, maybe the score shines more than it does here because they are pushing a lot the soundtrack songs, but uh, it is good. It's really good. Yeah, but not as good as the bevy of timeless, incredible insults that the people <laughs> at this school hurl at each other. It's a very Pussy aggro pukes. school they go to. Yeah, yeah. so they're, they're throwing around... Just some fucking insults at each other that amused yeah. me so much. I had to document them to paper. No, Steve, I'm just true. wondering, man. Yeah, pissy, uh, pussy pukes. That's a pretty strong it's one. It said twice. Pussy pukes. Wow. said twice. Emily <laughs> noticed. So. Also, what do you know about blow dicks? You blow dicks. Yeah. Blow dicks. What? Does I'll that tell you what, mean? though. I'd rather be called that than a piss wad. Or an <laughs> anal probe. <laughs> you piss wad. You piss wad. You're a wad of piss. A wad of piss. Now, let me just... Anybody out there right now, if your piss comes out in wads, get to the doctor. Yeah, seek medical attention. If you have gelatin piss, uh, mucusy piss, any of that, just go get it checked out. That is bad. And if you don't, you are, as they say in this movie, a tit bag. <laughs> tit, tit bags. Bag. That's one of the, the insults thrown <laughs> yeah. on here as well. Tit, tit bags. bags. Oh, what the hell? Yeah. I, Again, I, there's I, that dialogue problem you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And this, I mean, so basically, I, I guess I should mention this. This story was written by David Wechter and Bruce Kimmel, and then... Uh, like uh Miramax had bought it uh in like 90 or something and then they after Kevin Williamson did Scream they were like hey, you want to rewrite this script cuz they were going to do it so he's responsible for most of the dialogue and it really does feel like it was a rushed four years for him because yeah. he probably was just like well they'll take whatever i give them and this is as much time as i've got pisswad here you go like <laughs> <laughs> i yeah, I, I think maybe both people involved, maybe Robert Rodriguez and Kevin Williamson, didn't have as much investment into it. But it still does. I mean, it still does. It has a lot of. It has a lot of Kevin Williamson to it. Like the dialogue, despite the fact that it a lot of times is just. I, I mean, pussy pukes. What? <laughs> I mean, I get it. But no one has ever said it. Um, no, uh, uh-uh, no. I, but like, it, it does have a whole lot of him to it. It's just, I don't know. It feels like maybe he didn't have as much time with it because you know they wanted Scream Two immediately after Scream, and then Scream Three immediately after Scream Two. So those four years were rushed for sure. No doubt, man. But you know what? Maybe these kids just learn how to talk so so nasty and vulgar. Because they're all back home reading their hidden copies of Boob Magazine. Boob Magazine. Lowercase boob. b, 
uppercase O's, lowercase B. <laughs> Singular. Yeah. Boob. Boob magazine. I read an article in Boob magazine. <laughs> I really enjoy thinking about what the content of Boob magazine might be like and how mm. maybe the tagline is like, these ladies shook one out. And it's just singular boob. Just you never boob. get the set. You never get well, both. One out. Exactly, yeah. man. Just just the one. Just the one. Yeah, I hmm. I mean, that's a very particular fetish. <laughs> just just the one. Maybe yeah. there's also like another magazine called Cheek, and it's just like half a butt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. Yeah, all right. I mean, I can see huh. I mean, And then yeah, you know what I... I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about all the kids at home with their issue of boob or cheek magazine, <laughs> and what they do is they they hold it up to a mirror so they can get the mirror image of the other boob or butt cheek. <laughs> 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 now I have boobs. Now I can see the whole pair. Yeah, I outsmarted boob <laughs> magazine. <laughs> They won't let him print but the one boo because of the decency clause. <laughs> but I've outsmarted them. I like that that <laughs> is in two scenes, by the way. The dad is. is carrying it again later. Like, I guess he was looking at it. <laughs> hey, man, that guy's been married a long time. He's doing new yeah. boob. Yeah, that's true. And he's got golf to do because he's Shooter McGavin. <laughs> I know that guy is a million other things, but yeah, will no, always no, he's shooting again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's all that I know him as. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gotta love yourself that boob magazine, man. I will say though, like even though this doesn't really feel much like a Rodriguez movie, there were some shots and stuff in it that I thought were really fucking cool. Like I think that mm -hmm. scene where you've got the the football coach T one thousand. Hey, yeah. And he's standing out there with all the football players in yeah, the rain. That's and great. the lightning flashes, and you kind of see mm -hmm. the skull face on his face yeah. and the tendrils coming out. Fucking awesome. Yeah. And uh, whenever Elijah Wood is running from the alien in like the the locker room and then under the, the bleachers, like all of that is shot great action. Just like the way that everything is just going to shit behind him as he's running. Yeah, so totally. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, the the pacing of the movie, I think, is really good, other than uh -huh. again the, the faux the very thing long. scene. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, the pacing is great. Like it really moves along very well and gives you enough character explanation and enough story progression to keep you interested without it really ever feeling like it's lagging at any point. Mm -hmm. Um so I think the pacing of this movie is definitely a strong suit too. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, it's definitely not hard to watch at all for me. Uh, I can imagine if somebody has never seen it and maybe didn't grow up in that era to get Present. that. Yeah, it, mm, yeah, it might not, it might not hit, but it definitely reminds me of so many other '90s films that I'm like, yeah, this is right in line with exactly what was happening at the time, but. It's it's different, just slightly different enough that I'll always have a positive association with it. Yeah, totally. And, you know, another thing, too, that sets it apart for me from a lot of those other movies that came out at that time is, like, you know, in all those other movies, whether it be I Know What You Did Last Summer or Scream or whatever, there's always that scene where, you know, the killer is like, yeah, and then I did this and I stalked you here and that was me behind the school bus that day, blah, blah, right. blah. There's not really a lot of explanation in this. It's like you said, we don't no. we don't know where these things came from. They yeah. don't go to a um, let's say a Native American reservation at the edge of the town where they tell them yeah, where that they aliens learn. landed here a million <laughs> years ago, like in fucking yeah. it or whatever. Like uh -huh. there's never really any explanation for these things. We're not exactly sure about the the incubation period or right. everything yeah. that it entails oh, yeah, that or is... anything like that. Yeah, that that's a question I had because like it seems like, say, for instance, in that opening bit with Robert Patrick chasing B.B. New Earth, um, when she gets to the door, it seems like, and I I think this because specifically she is showing concern, I think she is still not changed into an alien yet because yeah. there's really no reason for, for her to pretend to be concerned she could just be standing there staring at her like well you're gonna die no matter what 
Uh, so there is some sort of like incubation period that also, I mean, we also see with Jordana Brewster's character, um, Delilah, like we know, we don't even know when she got infected or whatever yeah, with it. No idea. But you know, she seems to be fine up to a point and then boom. So the incubation period doesn't make much sense to me. <laughs> like it's mm -hmm. all over the place. It seems to happen instantly with, uh, Selma Hayek. Yeah. Yeah, but in like, a way, it's like you could even say it is consistently inconsistent. That's true. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, human bodies would uh, react differently. You, I mean, that happens in zombie movies as well, where somebody will turn... I mean, train to Basan. Somebody will turn instantly. Yeah. Some people can sort of push it off. Resist like, it, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I can, I can get with that. That's fine. Uh, because they didn't go into it too much. As you were saying, like, because we don't get all this explanation and stuff, it's fine for it to be inconsistent because it's like, well, yeah, we don't know how it works. Maybe that's exactly how it's supposed to work. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And I like I, that like, they went that route, too, rather than just, you know, spood feeding us all this exposition and explanation as to where this thing came from, what its home planet is, why it's on Earth, like, yada, yada. I'm surprised that they kept it as ambiguous as they did. Yeah. Yeah. Which was smart. Uh, I think this movie, the ambiguity to it is is smart, and in fact, that's my problem with a lot of the lines is that they're subtext. Like whenever, whenever um, Josh Hart Zeke, <laughs> whenever he's like looking in the microscope or whatever, and the Southern girl says. Oh, you know about this or whatever? He says, I'm complicated. It's just like, ugh. <laughs> yeah, we got that. Like, you don't need to say that part. Yeah. Like, that's a bad line. Just cut yeah. that. No doubt, man. Yeah, definitely not without its flaws. Yeah. But I was pleasantly surprised overall with how this fits into that entire era of movies. I mean... It also shows some, I think, some writing chops from Kevin there that he doesn't just mm -hmm. write the same old bunch of yeah. school kids, one of them's killing each other, yada, yada, kind of thing. Like, it shows that he has other interests in writing things that are sci-fi or monster-themed. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's cool. It's good for him to diversify his portfolio like that. Yeah. I liked it more than I thought that I would. Like, I don't like it, you know, nearly as much as Scream or something like that. All right. Mm. And I'm also not seeing it through the lens of, of nostalgia yeah, because I didn't see this movie when it came yeah. out, you know? Um, it's not something that I think is perfect by any means. I do think it deserves a better swing with more emphasis on the conformity aspects and the depth of those archetypes. And hell, even um, bring back Robert Rodriguez and let him really Rodriguez the film up. Yeah, I'd be yeah. very okay with that, man. Yeah, let him go totally in with his style yeah. and his take on what this would be and uh, let Antonio Banderas be the principal. I'd be okay with that. Yes, all right. <laughs> and Danny Trejo is a janitor or the totally. football coach. Yeah, yes. there we go. Now we're talking, man. You got any final thoughts, uh, grievances, complaints, praises, <laughs> anything you want to heap on this? Uh, Yeah, no grievances. Um. This, you know, the, the, as I've been saying, the dialogue is really a hindrance at times for me. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, its message stands up quite as much today, but it still was, uh, it was in 1998. It was a good message. Um, I, the acting is great. I like all these people, Josh Hartnett. It's great to see Josh Hartnett, Elijah Wood. This is right before, uh, Lord of the Rings, so this is his transition basically from child actor to uh, adult actor. Uh, uh, I mean, the performances are good. The problems I have with it are really easily overlooked. It can you can just sit and enjoy this movie. I think like True. you can just turn it on and have a good time with it. So, uh, yeah, I don't have any major problems with it, but it's. Yeah, you're right. It's not it's not as good a scream. It's not one that I constantly am telling people they need to watch. <laughs> like it's not one that jumps to my mind immediately, but it is worth a watch and still still good. Still has a lot of good to it. So I, I'd say like uh like a six six and a half. Yeah. I think yeah. that's pretty fair. I think that's pretty fair. Because especially if you think you've seen it all in terms of 
that late 90s slasher era. Right. This it, one is this definitely is, a curveball. Uh-huh. Yeah, this will definitely need to be added to the checklist of 90s movies to watch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's not one of those ones like whenever we did Final Destination for the show and I <laughs> liked it because it was so shitty and like right. so stupid and just so fucking right. terribly 90s. This movie never reaches that so bad it's good level. You know, it right. never really reaches that point where it's just like, holy fuck, this is just dog shit and that's why I'm enjoying it like Final Destination. Right. Uh, this plays it pretty real. You know, it, it keeps everything pretty, pretty serious and pretty enjoyable and pretty, you know, reasonably real to life. I suppose you'd say for the situation that these kids are in, it never goes into like I said, shitty good territory. It just tries to stay good, good, neutral, good, chaotic, yeah. good. You know. Yeah. And uh, I think I'm right there with you. I think six is probably where I would put this on. Where I'm not like in a rush to rewatch this one again, like I am with Scream or something like that. But at the same time, if it's on, I'm not going to complain. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, uh, definitely a fun watch. And thanks to Tim Stone for putting this one into the old smoking bowl of movies that we choose at random so we can do a podcast about them. I think that's the name, right? Yeah. That's the name of that's it? That's it. That's it. Oh, okay. Got it. I have to again, remember. Too succinct. I need to make a little label to put on there. <laughs> yeah, so we don't forget that very obvious name that we've given it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you guys want to drop your own suggestion into the smoking bowl, you can yeah. do that becoming a $5 a month supporter on Patreon.com. Yeah, Patreon.com forward slash dead and lovely. Head on over there. $5 a month supporters. You get to, to, to drop a, a name in the bowl to get randomly drawn and maybe we'll cover it just like we did. The faculty today. Yeah. That's right. You guys always drop some good suggestions in there. So please. Yeah, keep we got a lot of great stuff in there. Keep the reviews coming on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you can rate us on. Seriously, it helps us out like yeah, it do. a lot. Like it really, really does. Uh, podcasts that have really great ratings show up in search engines more. So go on there and give us the best ratings that you can. And also at the end of your review, Drop us a question that you'd like for us to answer on a future Preview Palace FAQ installment. So that gives you a free chance to get a little bit of what you want to hear on this show on here. So go in there, write us a review, drop us a question at the end of it. Now, Steve, I am excited about the movie that we're covering next week. Yeah, Yeah, I I am too. Because every time I see it in as I'm scrolling through movies, I'm like, man, that looks good. Yeah, same here, man. This is one of those ones that I heard about from a friend of mine, and I just watched a trailer for it the other day, even though it came out last year. I think it was a 2019 movie, if I'm not mistaken. I think right? so, yeah. And it looks like it's going to be one of those ones that is a visual feast that is very dark and folksy and brooding and dork, because we're going to be talking about... Hagazusa. Hagazusa. This movie looks fucking dope. Witch in old high German. So expect some witchery. All right, man. You know, we love ourselves some witchery here on this podcast. Mm -hmm. So I expect this is going to be one that we enjoy and love a long time. I think I might watch it tonight, actually, because I'm so excited to see it, man. Get to it. Yeah, dude. So you guys be sure to tune in next week for our review of Hagazusa. It's streaming right now on Shutter, but you can probably yeah. also rent it on, you know, Prime or whatever. Mm, probably. But definitely yep. is streaming on Shutter. So it's out there. Check her out. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I hope everybody out there in podcast land is doing well. Thank you guys so much for the support that you've given us, our buddy Brandon, and all that kind of stuff. You guys make our dreams come true. You guys are the best. And we are Uncle Ben. And Hollywood Steve. And we're dead and lovely, and we will catch you guys next week. Goodbye. Piss bag. <laughs> ben, I want to tell you one of the horror stories of Keto. <laughs> It's a horror podcast. Now's the time yeah. to let it loose, man, about the, the, the terrifying world that you live in, free of carbohydrates. Yeah, I mean, so basically on keto, uh, for me, 
I am aiming for 40 net carbs a day, Ben. Okay. Now, that's not All a right. whole lot, but that, that is net carbs. So that means fiber doesn't count. So All right. Mm-hmm. You can get all the fiber you want. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes I do this, Ben. I'll take a, a serving of peanuts, which has about uh, uh, six grams of protein and maybe about nine grams of carbs, but a couple of those are, are fiber. Okay, I enjoy myself a peanut. I've been known yeah, to munch too. down on one. Just Love. just a handful of just a regular old peanut. Yep, just just uh, some, some regular old roasted, lightly salted peanuts. I'll take those, and then right after, I'll take my fiber gummies for the day <laughs> that are seven grams of carbs, Ben, but five of those are fiber. Oh. And it tastes faintly like the whisper of a bite of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> so it's like a fruit-flavored gummy is what you're telling me. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, and it, it kind of <laughs> has, like, the, uh, luckily the texture of it is kind of jelly-like once you get, like, get it chewed up a little bit, so mm -hmm, you still yeah. got that peanut flavor in your mouth, and then you got this kind of, sort of, fruit flavor. <laughs> <laughs> And so the reason this is a horror story is because this is one of the highlights of my diet. <laughs> Getting old is fun, isn't it, right? It's like when, it you, when you're a kid, you're like, you know what I think I'll have for lunch? I'll have some refined carbohydrates, mm -hmm. sugar, right. sugar, mm -hmm. and sugar. Right. And then when you, when you get old, you're like, I got to find something that kind of reminds me of that that'll keep me from getting fat and help me take a shit. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so so that's that's why it's a horror story. Because when I have that faint moment of like ah oh, childhood bliss, I also am like, and I'll be pooping well. <laughs> so welcome to this new installment of Dead and Lovely Kitchen <laughs> Corner with Hollywood Steve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>